Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Tennis Channel Inside In. We're on the Tennis Channel podcast. Mitch Michaels from the Santa Monica Studios. As always, to talk about some more tennis and more storylines in the world and the game we know and love. Joined now again by a friend of the show, reoccurring guest, top five former player. Still going strong in the broadcast world. You can find him on Prime. You can find him covering the sport overseas in Great Britain. Greg Rosetsky, welcome back to the show. Now that we've caught our breath after this major season, good to chat with you again. Oh, it's been a great season for the majors. You know, the last one, we were hoping all for the Alcaraz Djokovic finals. Alcaraz lost in the semis, couldn't get back to that final. We're hoping a Wimbledon rematch, but Novak showed us why he's the greatest men's tennis player of all time, winning his 24th slam. Absolutely brilliant. 27 and 1 in majors. And what a story for the Americans as well. Coco Goff winning her first ever major in New York with new coach. Brad Gilbert, good to see you investing in her team. And, you know, American tennis really needed this win. Yeah, and I wanted to get your thoughts on Coco before we go to Djokovic because isn't it kind of funny how the last couple months went? Because Wimbledon, right in your backyard, you saw her lose first round to Kennan. She was, her game was in disarray. People were doubting it. Every commentator was talking about what they would do with their forehand. She went to the experts, and I bring it together because we've talked about Coco a while on this show and beyond. But continuity and good coaching and good, you know, development matters. Even if you are, in Coco's case, one of the best athletes in the world, she just needed that extra 2%, 3%, and she found the right guys in her team to do it. Well, she did. I, mean, I think um, that's the key for, for Coco. I mean, she's a phenomenal athlete, mentally so tough. We talked about the forehand problems, the second serve problems. And, you know, Brad just brought a perspective. Let's not focus on those things. Let's get the job done. We're going to work on those things, but we're not talking about them. We're just going to get the strategy right. And, you know, Washington, she was absolutely amazing winning the title. And then the run, obviously, in Canada and Cincinnati leading into the Open. And to do it in the manner that she did in that final as well was so impressive. And let's not forget, the last 19-year-old American that won the U.S. Open was a certain person by the name of Serena Williams. So uh, it's taken her a little bit longer than we've expected to get there, but it's good to see. And also, she feels like she's been a pro for like forever. But let's not forget, she's still only 19 years of age. Yeah, 19 years old, already with four full seasons on tour. And really, the sky is the limit. You never want to cap or project these things. I feel like another guy in Carlos Alcaraz, it's a little unfair, some of the expectations being placed on him. But you start to do the math, right? Four majors a year, 19 years old. There's a, there's a chance Coco could go on a little run here. Well, there is. And the other thing I think we need is we need a rivalry in the women's game, especially because in the men's game, you got Carlos, the young buck versus Novak Djokovic, the legend of our sport. You know, you either need Coco Fiontech, you need Coco Zabulenka. You need a group that's playing in major finals or semis week in, week out. And I look back at the time where I loved tennis growing up as a kid. It was McEnroe Borg finals, Martina Chrissy, the, the longest and greatest rivalry in tennis playing over 80 times, you know, that's what we yeah. want to see. And also Coco brings in another audience to this sport as well who aren't tennis fans, and that is a big plus. Yeah, I think the women's game, especially going off your point, this was a great, and I said it last week, a great major season for them. All the players that won, and I'll throw Von Dressova in there because she finished here strong in the top 10. They all had great seasons. They all look like they're going to be factors going forward. It would be nice to get that concentration of talent at the top, but – you know, if we have a mix of, and I'll say this even for the men's side, because Djokovic is still going strong, but if we can have a mix of four to six players that are constantly in the in the battle, that would be good too. I agree with you that a great iconic rivalry, but you know, sometimes that just doesn't happen. Yeah, I think if we look in the men's game, for example, you've got Djokovic, Alcaraz, Sinner's trying to come to the party. He's mm -hmm. invested in Darren Cahill this year, and he's still not the finished product, but he's heading in the right direction. Daniil Medvedev, you know, back to his best. So you've got to look at those four guys yeah. as the rivalry in the men's game. Yes, you can talk about Pass getting into the mix, getting to the finals of Australia. In the women's game, you know, the talk was, okay, we've got a rivalry with Fiontech and Sabalenka being the two players that are going to be there. Then you said Vondrasova went on to uh, win Wimbledon. Coco's gone on to win the U.S. Open. Mm -hmm. So hopefully those four players can get in the mix with Rabakina, or Rabakina, depending on how you say it. Everybody says it a little differently. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a good point, too, Rabakina. You can't forget about her. There's a lot of players on the women's side, and I want to switch to the men for, for now. And you, you referenced it. 2023 is going to be remembered as the year of Novak Djokovic, 27-1 and one in the majors at age 36. 
what I keep coming back to, Greg, is the fact that he just continues to stay motivated at his age. At you know, pick your metric, right? The number of majors he's won, the amount of money he has, the fact that he is the greatest player ever by all numbers, yet he's still out here, you know, playing an hour forty four minute set and set two against Medvedev, still in the fight. What do you think is pushing him at this point to continue to extend his greatness and his reign? Well, he wants to be known as the greatest of all time, not even having a debate about it. There's only one athlete in sport, I can think, especially in American sport, Tom Brady. I mean, look at all the Super Bowls he's won. Ironically, Tom Brady was there watching Novak Djokovic. Novak, to me, is the best athlete on the planet at the moment, bar any sport. I don't care what sport you're talking about. His consistency, what he's doing on court, and what he's doing at his age, nobody else has done before, apart from Tom Brady with those Super Bowl wins. So uh, right now I'd say he's the GOAT, wanting 27, 28 majors and distancing himself from the pack. He's tied Margaret Court with 24. He not only wants to be the best male tennis player, he wants to be the best tennis player, male, female, anything. An Olympic gold next year in Paris is huge for Novak. 36 is what I just keep coming back to because we've seen runs like this I and mean, we've seen Djokovic do this. Obviously, Federer, Macro had 84. There's been iconic tennis years, but never this late in the game. That's just the marvel. And it's, look, and it was like, I think it was Sitsipas who said that Djokovic's diet is the greatest thing in sports, his ability to manage his body. But there's truth to that, right? The fact that he's so healthy, so fit, and can do things like this at what we would consider post-prime. Well, I think he's the most professional. Even we heard Rafa talking about it, saying uh, on Instagram and Twitter, he was saying, look, I had so many injuries throughout. Novak's always been healthy. He's the guy who's always gotten through physically. And that in itself is a skill. People don't look at recovery, health, consistency, all those things. And to have that motivation and drive at 36 years young is incredible. I mean, I was brain dead by the time I was 36, just playing some social tennis and some champions, uh, champions tennis on the, uh, on the senior tour. So for him to do this at this high level and still be the best player on the planet is exceptional. Let's enjoy it because this is a very rare thing to see in the sport. And I think he's finally getting all the credit he deserves because, you know, he's always under the shadows of Federer and Nadal with the love and, the admiration and now he's really getting what he deserves from what he's accomplishing yeah you, you hit the nail on the head it's rare i mean it's not rare that tennis players are having longer longevities in general but to do what he's doing at 36 is a unicorn and you know i think part of the motivation is a guy like alcaraz coming up and challenging the throne and he's like okay this is a new challenge a different beast you referenced it in this summer really flipped the the, the summer flip in that Cincinnati match. And you referenced that as Djokovic's greatest comeback ever because that match was a war of attrition. The conditions were brutal. Alcaraz still has some learning to do, but Djokovic was dead to rights, and yet he finds a way to win that match and really flip the whole U.S. Open series. Well, he did, and he was struggling with heat stroke during that match because it was brutally hot in Cincinnati. He, t he knows how to manage those situations, took a little bit more time, had the trainer come out, won that second set, and then all of a sudden he pushes it into the final set and he raises his game. It was Carlos who got frustrated, got a little bit angry out there, and Novak just knew how to handle the bigger situations better. And For me, that was the defining match which got him to win the U.S. Open. Had he lost that match, we might not be talking about three slams and only one loss, but... Also, I think you've got to go back to Wimbledon where Novak was a little bit unlucky because he should have been up two sets to love. Conditions were very windy. I was doing that final, and his serve was really negated in that final, which Alcaraz took advantage of. And from that second set on, with the way the conditions were and executing on the big points, it, it was Carlos, the youngster, who, who took advantage. So uh, Novak will be very pleased about three out of four majors this year and uh, number 24. And also... Coming up next year, he's got the Australian Open, his most successful major. So I have a feeling 25, 26 is in store for next year at least. Yeah, it's it's scary to think. And I know that everyone will say he was one match away. And, and, and you reference it, right? Sometimes a loss is beneficial. He uses that loss, gets motivated, locks in. And, and for Alcaraz, too, I know his year was great as well. Wins Wimbledon up to two majors. Now still a lot to learn. You got to remember the age, how young he is, just a 20-year-old kid that's still figuring some stuff out. The game is is there. He's light years ahead of his peers. Uh, again, something he can learn from, not just the Wimbledon, not just the Cincinnati match, rather, but the loss to Medvedev at the U.S. Open. 
Alcrest still has some learning to do, but uh, he's already light years ahead, as I said. Well, you got to think that was the first time in his career he's had to defend a major. Yeah. Not a bad effort making the semis. I mean, most people, if you get to the semis of a major, that's career defining. In America, you're talking about Shelton right now making the semis, beating Tiafo in the quarters. What a great result. The world number one loses in the semis. What's going on? And let's be yeah. honest. He's world number one for most of that this year, but all the players still think Djokovic is number one because he wasn't allowed to play Indian Wells, Miami, all the majors he missed as well because of his stance that he had with COVID as well, not getting vaccinated. So you've got to look at all those things that were around the whole situation for Novak. Yeah. So I think Novak felt he was number one, even though the ranking didn't say so. Were you at all surprised? And I want to get into this and pull the, the layers back for people that don't follow tennis week in, week out. But Djokovic playing the Davis Cup immediately after winning the U.S. Open and just showing you how much tennis means to him, also national pride means to him. And I grouped this in with Alcaraz, who played the Hopman Cup a week after winning Wimbledon. Does anything about that as a former tennis player, player and Davis Cup, you know, stand out for Great Britain? Does that surprise you at all that these guys are right back on the court after winning a major? Well, it- I think for Alcaraz, after winning a major, he'd committed to the Hopman Cup. Would he have wanted to play the Hopman Cup? Probably not, if I'm honest with you. So this time, he was exhausted after New York, pulled out of the Davis Cup, which was probably the right play. It cost Spain qualifying for the final eight. While Novak, on the other hand, had quite a deep team. So he only had to show up for the last match on the last day. But it's nice to see him back in the Davis Cup. And now they're in the finals, final eight. It'd be great to see if Novak decides he wants to play in the final eight and and try to get another Davis Cup title. He's a dedicated man to his country. There's nothing wrong with that. It's now 20 straight singles ties that he's won in the Davis Cup. He had the nice home reaction. Uh, It's been been good to see his greatness. Alcaraz hot on his heels. I did want to get your thoughts, though, because everyone's had an opinion. I wanted to hear yours. Ben Shelton match, the guy that got a little heated with Novak Djokovic. (laughs) I didn't have a problem with it. I'm also a fan of some other sports, too. I know some tennis people might not have liked his celebrations, then Djokovic kind of giving it right back to him. But what was your reaction to Djokovic hanging up the phone? Oh, well, Novak needs to get himself motivated. He's very disciplined. He had the crowd against him, you know, obviously going for the American youngster up-and-coming buck. And uh, whatever he does, does to get himself going, why not? I know... Um, Shelton's dad wasn't too happy with the behavior. I read about that on, on, on GQ. We talked about, but that's part of getting into the battle and so forth. And Shelton didn't mind it so much. So I don't mind it from Novak. You know, in sport, it's like sometimes you don't always do the politically correct things, but in the heat of the moment, sometimes you, you do these celebrations and things. And we're talking about it. So it's bringing more fans to the game. Yeah, that's the name of the game. There's more interest as a result. And uh, Ben Shelton, somebody I, I did want to hear your perspective on as a big server, if he's in the club now, the uh, <laughs> text message going on. But he's got a lot of games. Some of it's raw. You know, the serve is impressive. For me, Greg, it's going to be about can he learn to grind out wins? when Because he, he's clearly a big match player. He's proven that already. But he didn't have a great tour season, 7 and 18, coming into the Open. How can he grind out match wins, get through when he's not at his best? And play players that might not have the, the center court appeal like Novak Djokovic, how he does on the tour season. Well, I, I think also year two is always the most difficult. So he wasn't as good as he was last season. Good news for him is his dad, Brian Shelton, was a very good professional, won two tour titles, I believe, in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, so he's got a good family, good team of people around him. He's got the firepower. As you say, he needs to have a B, C, and a D game, but he's still young. Got a massive serve, massive weapons, big forehand, good athlete, but just needs to have that defensive capabilities when the A game isn't working. So he's just got to get those balance and add those little extra dimensions. And I think he will. He's got plenty of time. He's got good people around him. And why not? And for American tennis, you know, it's great in the men's game as well as in the women's. We know about Coco, obviously. You know, having Tiafo playing Shelton in the quarters of a major is great. Then you've got Fritz as well. You need one of these young bucks to be in a slam final or try to win one because, you know, it was great that Andy Ruddick was there handing out the prizes for the U.S. Open. I think it's uh, about time we see an American man in the finals, if not win one of these majors, which is going to be a big, big ask with Alcaraz and obviously Djokovic playing so well. Yeah, it'll be 21 years. It'll be the legal drinking age next year since Roddick last won. <laughs> US last won a major. So we need to we need to end that streak here. 
And I'll ask you that point blank because you're obviously a very honest, forthright guy. Do you think Ben Shelton, if you had to predict, has the best chance to be the guy of the current crop of players on American men's side? Well, I think he's got more time because in five years' time, I don't think Novak's going to be around, but you never know. Life could <laughs> yeah, I don't know. five years later. Don't discount him ever. But you think the maturation process, the tools, the consistency, the day in, day out, and I think mentally – I think he's pretty tough. And also, let's not forget a certain guy by the name of Roger Federer is uh, his clothing sponsor and uh, his brand sponsor. So he thinks very highly of the young man. So I think he's got a real opportunity and a good shot to do that because it's timing, being in the right place at the right time with the right generation. Because his generation in five years' time will be Alcaraz, Sinner. Those will be the guys he's going to have to beat to try to win that major. So I think your wait might be a little bit longer. But in three yeah. to four years, I think that's when the door starts to possibly open. All right, three to four years, I'll, I'll mark my calendar. We'll get ready. <laughs> we'll try to celebrate. Uh, more with Greg Rosetsky here on Tennis Channel Inside and some other players I just want to get your thoughts on on the major season and beyond. We've had this djokovic Alcaraz iconic rivalry. They played great matches. They cleaned up the majors. As we look into the 2024 season, look ahead. What's that next crop look like of guys that could contend and possibly win? We know Medvedev has been rock solid, at least on the hard courts. There's been players like Holger Runa that have popped up and struggled. Sitsipas, you've mentioned. Zverev has looked better. Which players, maybe someone I didn't mention, do you think could be next up outside of the big two? Well, I think Holger Runa, because if you look at the uh, the like statistics, which I like to look at, the last time we had two teenagers in the top 10 in the world was Murray Djokovic. And the last two that have done that were Alcaraz and Holger Rune. So I think Rune, it's almost like he's had Patrick Mortogalu part of his team. And now it's kind of like, okay, who do you add on somebody different to help with the team and manage that to take him to the next stage? And I think that's where I have so much respect for Coco because the investment she put into bringing the team as well as add Brad Gilbert, who'd won a major. And I think Holger's probably the guy with the potential and firepower. And uh, one of my colleagues at Kenneth Carlson uh, from Denmark, who was the best Danish player before Holger came along in the men's game, I might add, because we all know about Car Caroline Wozniacki, everything she's achieved, yeah. um, said to me, I've got this 14 year old kid. He reminds me of Roger Federer. He's going to be unbelievable. I'm like, okay, I've heard it before, but he's starting to show like he's the real deal. And, you know, last year was the breakthrough winning Paris master series. This year has been a little up and down for his, his ability but I feel like he's going to make a real push. And he's got that sort of swagger attitude where he doesn't really care and he kind of is himself. So I think he's the one to look out for that could possibly get to a major final and possibly win one outside of Djokovic, Sinner, and Alcaraz. Yeah, Holger is an interesting one because that's a very popular answer among players and you know former players and media types like yourself is that Holger has the potential. We see the game when it's on. And I actually don't even really mind too much some of the mental maturity that he's going to go through because he is young and I do think that will happen. I'm more concerned with some of the physical injuries that he's already had at this stage in the game. And we've seen it. We've already seen it this year with some of the back injuries and stuff. He didn't win a match post Wimbledon. And I know there's a lot of factors to go with that. but health-wise is what would give me a little pause because when he's healthy and he's out there, yes, he's one of the very best in the world. Yeah, but look at Alcaraz as well. He's had a few yeah. injuries coming in as well. I think it's just how hard the guys hit the ball right now. And let's not forget, for his age, 20 years of age, I mean, he's strong as a beast. It's just figuring <laughs> out getting that right physio with you, getting somebody on the team full-time traveling with you, and figuring it out. He's too determined, too driven <laughs> not to figure out a solution there. And I think we're going to see more injuries with players just because of how hard they hit the ball and how physically demanding it is and also the movement. We talk about Djokovic previously, how he sustained this until 36 years of age, being at the top of the sport. It's because his flexibility, his recovery, his physio, there's nobody who does it better than him. And that's yeah. what Alcaraz is learning because he's had a few injuries. And Holger's got to learn that a little bit more. And once he gets that down, he's going to find a solution to stay healthy and on court longer. And that's the key. Health is your wealth, as they say, right. in life, as well as in this sport. Right. And that's a great point about if he can just add the right people to his team, that could un unlock everything in terms of keeping him on the court and keeping him going. In that same regard, before we get to other players, do you think, Greg, that it's also about managing your schedule, especially this time? We know Djokovic isn't going to play Shanghai 
there's a lot of tennis to be played, but you have to be selective <laughs> as a player when you play it. Yeah, you do. But the problem for the youngsters, when they get in the top 10, everybody starts offering you a few hundred thousand to show up That's at the true. events, to go yeah. play. You got ranking and bonus money. And the ones that realize that it's so important to look at the long-term vision and say, my schedule is more important than getting a check here and there. And what is my ultimate goal? Is it to be great one year or is it to be great every year? And by mm. making the right schedule, taking those breaks, learning from the best. If, if I'm those young guys, I would befriend Novak Djokovic and say, look, how do you figure out your schedule? How yeah. much do you play? How little do you play? You know, a lot of the great players really pick the brains of the former legends or people who've managed to stay healthy. And for me, that's what the young generation has to look at because the prize money compared to my generation has gone out of sight. Even the players want more, and I can understand the reasoning behind that. But the ones that really get the good team, realize what they have to do and do the right schedule, those are the ones that are going to last longer. And it's figuring it out, but also take experience with you. Absolutely. Uh, wise words to live by as a tennis pro. Uh, and the other name I forgot to mention was someone you referenced, Yannick Sinner. He's you know, had these battles and there's so much to like about his game. I think he has added some stuff working with Darren Cahill recently. But I have to bring up the point. He's had a lot of these iconic long matches, hasn't seemed to win many of them. His longest matches, he does unfortunately come out on the losing side. What can or what will do you think he change? to get to a point where he can win some of these four-hour major matches? Well, I think he's got to get his transition game better, getting to the net. The ground strokes are, are unbelievable. Darren's done a good job improving the serve and just figuring out how to make his life a little bit easier and just to be a little bit bolder and braver during the very big, big moments and play with a little bit more freedom against the very, very best. And, and when he learns to do that, he'll get there. Let's not forget a certain guy by the name of Ivan Lendl took him five majors to win his first major. It took Murray five majors before he won his first major as well so give the guy a little bit of a break everybody was talking okay this guy's sinner he's going to be number one after Djokovic then Alcaraz shows up and he's the wonder kid you know sinner was the guy everybody was saying was going to be number one so now it's going to take him a little bit longer to get there but what I like is he's willing to invest in himself you know he had a Piatti who did a fantastic job with him and now he's showing his intent by hiring Cahill so my view is if Darren's staying on that project he only stays with players that win majors you look at it, Halep, Agassi, and Leighton Hewitt. And he took Leighton from a 15-year-old to U.S. Open champion. He took Andre at the end of his career. He took Halep to a major when she hadn't won a major in world number one. So uh, if Darren's on your team, Sinner's intent is not just to, to participate, but to win majors and try to get to the top of the men's game. No, he, he's for sure there. And it is a long-term approach. And sometimes it's timing. Unfortunately, in his case, Alcaraz did show up. But the good thing is he's still young and still has a lot to work and has beaten him before. So it's not a completely one-sided rivalry there. The other player I wanted to get your thoughts on, Greg, because he's kind of had a, re a renaissance and it took him a while from the injury is Alexander Zverev. He's starting to kind of show flashes of that top five level player. U.S. Open run being center was great. Didn't really have much of a chance coming off of the fatigue and having to play Alcaraz. But are you starting to be encouraged by what you're seeing from Zverev a year after his injury? Incredible stuff. I mean, he's had some serious ligament damage there. I mean, the terrible situation, three hours on court, had to be wheelchaired off in Paris. Let's not forget, he got to the semis of the French Open again after having that injury. He really wasn't back to his best, probably playing on one and a half feet. And now at the U.S. Open, he looks like he's finally getting fully fit and the foot seems good again. So he'll be in the mix. And it's always the same thing in between the ears right here. The second serve and the forehand, you look at it again. And I think he's starting to believe he belongs. And the pressure's off him. Everybody's talking mm -hmm. about Rune. They're talking about Alcaraz. They're not talking about Zverev. And that gives him a little bit more leeway and freedom. And for me, there's no reason he shouldn't be consistently in the top 10 top five with, with his tools and his game and his mindset. What's that like if you've ever been in the experience of, had the experience of coming back from an injury, a major injury like that, maybe being on the court a little sooner. I don't know if there's the rankings pressure of trying to get motivated there, but like you said, he was playing on one and a half feet, basically. What's the process like of kind of not just rediscovering your game, but the movement that you don't well, necessarily have? I think he'd be really encouraged because you make the semis of a major, you're not fully fit. 
And that shows you're, you're the basically top four player in the world because those are the tournaments everybody wants to win. And he says, I'm probably playing at about 70, 75% of my capabilities. So that's going to encourage him. And once he gets to 100% of his capabilities, he's easily top five in the world and in the mix week in, week out with his tools he has. So, uh, you know, I've had some serious injuries. And, I, you know, when I got to my U.S. Open final in 97, I came back because I'd torn my ligaments in Wimbledon three months later for the U.S. Open or two months. I played on one and a half foot and lost in the third round. But you want to get out there as long as you can't re-injure yourself. And once you get on court, it's like riding a bike. You get used to it, but you got to do the reps. You got to get on court. You got to see match situation because you can practice as hard as you want, but you can't replicate those matches until you go out there. There's the stress, the strain, the nervousness, all those other facets, and your body gets a lot stiffer and tighter. So I've been really impressed with his comeback. We should give him a lot of credit. Absolutely. It's another good player. We're glad he's back in the mix. And uh, yeah, I just want to put a bow on this convo with Daniil Medvedev, right? Because you can't forget about him. And what a way to you know work the crowd. And I, I put him in the all time. I mean, even guys in your era that just know how to get the crowd against <laughs> them for them, have him on the string. I like the nasty Medvedev, you know, when we saw him in New York for the first time, just going, come on, crowd, just give it yeah, to me. Yeah. And then we had that epic finals against Rafa. He came back from two sets to love and then obviously lost in five sets. And then when he won the U.S. Open against Djokovic, the match that killed him, though, was the two sets to love down under an Australia chance for double break, you know, going mm -hmm. to try to win his second major. We'd be probably talking about him consistently challenging for one. Had he won that second major in Australia, but it's great to see him back in New York in another finals. And for me, he's amazing what he's achieved, but he needs that second major desperately, I feel, because – psychologically that that really hurt him against rafa mm -hmm. yeah we've seen it time and time again with some of these players that get close even if they have majors it could be a brutal loss but he is someone that's going to factor into 2024 and beyond want to end this convo this uh, podcast with greg gruzetsky here on tennis channel inside in talking about some of the team events that we've seen in the past and going forward i know the davis cup a lot's been talked about greg and you've had your experiences with that where do you think we are with the Davis Cup before we get into, I guess, last weekend's results? Do you think it's going to get to a better place? Because there's been a lot of criticisms across the board, players included. Yeah, I think it's getting better. I don't think it's ideal. My point of view, home and away ties are the best thing that ever happens. And, and they've got to get back to the old format. The only thing I like is maybe not three out of five sets. Because it's hard to get the players to play three out of five sets, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then go to events. So, you know, I quite like maybe changing the formats where the players play two out of three sets. And if it goes one set all a deciding set tiebreaker and, you know, just get that home and away. Imagine, you know, we're lucky we had it in Manchester this year. So we had great crowds. Britain obviously qualified and got through for, for Malaga for the final eight. But for me, that's the essence of it. It's patriotism. It's people seeing their best players. People come to Davis cup in the past. who know nothing about tennis because they want to support their own country. And for me, that is the aspect that is missing, is having the home and away ties. And that's what they have to bring back. Did you ever have any rowdy crowds for or against you to where it got to a level that maybe you can't share everything that was said? Um, yeah, I've had a few. I mean, Davis Cup for us has always been memorable. We ended up losing one year to Ecuador at Wimbledon on court number one because I hurt my ankle. We lost in a deciding rubber. Went back to Ecuador, which was a football fan sort of nation. And the Lepenti brothers had never lost in 17 ties at home in a bull ring in Ecuador. We ended up beating them 3-0, um, won, the, won the doubles, me and Tim Henman. And our captain, Roger Taylor, we had to do a lap of honor. We had, like, bottles thrown at our heads. We had, like, everything because it wasn't really your tennis audience that was watching. Yeah. Because those are always memorable ties when you go to South America or go away or have home ties like Birmingham, Dan Evans talked about being very special when we lost to America and I lost the final rubbler to Jim Courier in a fifth set. And it's the atmosphere and the environment of home and away and bringing those people into tennis that don't mm. watch tennis week in, week out, which I think is so important for a game. In an actual bull ring, I thought you were going to say bulls were coming out too, like everything. <laughs> Next level stuff. But no, that's, those are the stories we like to hear. And like you said, Great Britain was in a good position having it in Manchester, having the team come through Evans and Murray with a nice tribute to his grandma who just passed. And then Jack Draper. I don't know if you saw the video that went viral of 
Murray giving Draper a ride back in the car, but that was, we're going to try to splice it in the video. But Draper, a nice 21 year old kid celebrating the win, singing some of the proclaimers and Murray just it fully embracing his uh, older man stage of life was yeah. just phenomenal. It, it is great to see. And also, Jack had his debut. So he was the 323rd player to represent uh, his country in Davis Cup or in Fed Cup. Um, so that in itself was a great feat. He got off to a winning win. And it's like kind of the passing of the torch, I would say, because Murray's the older statesman. Hard to, say, hard to believe saying that. Because I, I was the older statesman when he first came on as a 17 or 18 year old. And wh where has the time gone? But uh, he's always been good with the younger generation, giving back to them, spending a lot of time working with them. And he follows every level, whether it's in the futures, the challengers, and sees what all the British players are doing. So he's got a great relationship with the next generation coming up. And, uh, you know, as you said, it was great that he, he gave that tribute to his grandma, who unfortunately passed as well as, you know, spending the time with the youngsters in the car, singing the Proclaimers. Good Scottish music for Andy, obviously. Yeah, it is. And I think Jack Draper is a guy, not just because I'm talking to, you know, a former British player, but I think he's one to watch. I think he's got game. I think fitness was more of an issue in the past. Had a great U.S. Open, gave Rublev all he can handle. I think there's a lot to like on the upside for Jack Draper. For Jack, it, we talked about it earlier, health is your wealth. If he was healthy... Throughout this season, he'd be top 30 player by the end of the year easily. I mean, mm -hmm. I was speaking to Francisco Roy, who was obviously uh, working with uh, Rafael Nadal um, for many years um, before they, they parted company. And he was like a Draper, yeah, top 10 for sure. And that's my opinion. Draper will be a top 10 player as long as he stays healthy. That's the key ingredient because he's had too many shoulder, a little bit of rib problems, these things. And if he can stay healthy for a season, there's no reason why 2024 he shouldn't finish in the top 20 in the world. I agree. It's it's definitely going to be one to watch and one to uh, take notice of. Last thing here with Greg Rosetsky, we do have the Labor Cup coming up. It's a different version because the big four are not a part of this. Europe is in a different place. And but I, what I mean by that is not an overwhelming favorite, but yeah. some interesting yeah. players to watch. I know it's a different team event, an exhibition, if you will, but what I wanted to focus on for the time being were the players that are just trying to find you find their game and get back to their successful ways. Felix was one that stood out to me, OJ Aliassime, because he is someone that could use a reset and a refresh, and maybe it does happen at this Labor Cup. Yeah, you're, you're hoping so. I mean, the Labor Cup last year was huge for him. He played great tennis, and then he had a great finish to the end of the season. And that's where, you know, Frederick Fontan, who's been with his team for a, a long time, we had Uncle Tony work with him, Maybe just needs a new sort of input to get that mojo back because when he's on, he's great. But then you look at his BC game, and that's what the very best guys have. Like Daniil Medvedev got to the U.S. Open Finals, wasn't playing great tennis going into New York City, but was still finding a way to get results. And that's what the very best guys in the world do who consistently stay in the top five, top ten in the world is when they're not playing their best tennis, they still find ways to make quarters, semis, and finals of events week in, week out. And for Felix, I think the Labor Cup will be very important for him to get his mojo back. The good news for him as well is, you know, Canada managed to qualify for the final eight with no Chapeau, no Auger, and they're still in there. So he's got a lot of tennis to look forward to to get his game back for 2024. And I, I like him as a person, and I'd really love to see him getting his tennis back to where it was. Playing in front of the uh, home crowd in Vancouver will be fun. It's a, a good field there with Monfils, the legend, still out there in the mix. You've got players like Taylor Fritz who went on to make the semifinals of the ATP Tour Finals. So you're right, it could propel you for a great end of the year. The last thing, though, is do you think we'll see what we one of the few things we haven't seen the rivalry, Djokovic, Alcaraz on a fast indoor hard court, maybe the ATP Finals? Yeah, I, th I think we could see that. I think the nice thing is... Carlos has something to prove because he'll be bitterly disappointed. You know, he'll say, okay, Novak's number one, but he wants to throw the gauntlet down for the beginning of the year in Australia. And I think that he's going to be in great shape physically and mentally. And I think that's one of the reasons why he missed Davis Cup was because mentally he's so fatigued from everything he's been through that he needs a little break. Because let's not forget from Canada all the way to the U.S. Open, we saw more frustration in Carlos than we've seen throughout the last few years. And to me, that looks 
stress, mental fatigue, and handling being number one and dealing with pressure. So this is a nice time for him to reset. And I do hope we get that final. But conditions also in Turin, let's not forget, are pretty quick, pretty fast. And they have some Italian guy there that they might be cheering for Sinner. And Djokovic <laughs> in it, Italy is absolutely loved. He's the fan favorite. I have a lot of Italian friends. It's Djokovic, Djokovic, Djokovic. Yeah. yeah. Well, I hope we get to see it. This has been a uh, blast talking tennis again with Greg Ruzetsky, who, you know, as you said beforehand, you got to get, you know, stretched out for some exhibition tennis coming up here. <laughs> yeah, I've got an XO in Scotland. I'm playing the Brodies Cup. We've got Mark Philippoussis in singles, some doubles and mixed doubles. Uh, I've, I haven't had more tennis balls than I've hit in the last three weeks. So it should be a lot of fun and really looking forward to it. But at 50 years of age, singles can be a challenge. Doubles is more fun. I'm no Novak Djokovic, that's for sure. <laughs> Staying active, staying at it. We love it. Well, as always, it was a blast. Greg Ruzetsky, welcome for sure anytime. Thanks for coming on the Tennis Channel Inside In podcast. Thank you so much for having me.